Welcome to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, episode number 79. If I'm doing my job right, then I'm not writing the dialogue. The characters are just saying the dialogue, and I'm just jotting it down. Quentin Tarantino. Broadcasting from a dark, windowless room in Hollywood, when we really should be working on that next draft, it's the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, showing you the craft and business of screenwriting while teaching you how to make your screenplay bulletproof. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast. I am your humbled and quarantined host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Bulletproof Script Coverage. Now, unlike other script coverage services, Bulletproof Script Coverage actually focuses on the kind of project you are and the goals of the project you are. So we actually break it down by three categories, micro-budget, indie film market, and studio film. There's no reason to get coverage from a reader that's used to reading tentpole movies when your movie's going to be done for $100,000. And we wanted to focus on that at Bulletproof Script Coverage. Our readers have worked with Marvel Studios, CAA, WME, NBC, HBO, Disney, Scott Free, Warner Brothers, The Blacklist, and many, many more. So if you need your screenplay or TV script covered by professional readers, head on over to CoverMyScreenplay.com. And guys, I have a special treat for you. If you are interested in getting a three-part video series on screenwriting and how to write blockbusters in Hollywood today by some Oscar winners, some multi-billion dollar screenwriters, all you got to do is head over to BulletproofScreenwriting.tv forward slash free video series. Sign up for it there and you will get three amazing videos, almost an hour in length total in your inbox. So just head over to bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash free video series. Well, guys, today on the show, we have the legendary Linda Seeger, who is the author of a new book called You Talking to Me? How to Write Great Dialogue. And she's also the author of the best-selling screenwriting book, Making Good Scripts Great. And I wanted to have her back on because now she is focused specifically on dialogue and writing good dialogue and making that dialogue crackle and pop off the page. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Linda Seeger. I'd like to welcome back to the show returning champion, Linda Seeger. How are you, Linda? I am just fine, in spite of everything. Yes, it is, it is a crazy, wacky world we are living in, but I think storytellers, filmmakers, screenwriters are more needed now than ever before. And it's a good time to do writing. Yeah. What else you, are we doing? I mean, you know, you would think, you would think, but uh, yeah, when you're quarantined, you have no excuses anymore. You can't say, oh, I have to go out to do this. I'm like, no. So now you actually literally have to face not only the white page, but you also have to face yourself. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we're here to talk about uh, your new book, You Talking to Me. Uh, you Talking to Me? Sorry, I have to do the whole De Niro thing. You Talking to Me, How to Write Great Dialogue. And I haven't really had a full episode just dedicated to dialogue. And it's such an important part of screenwriting. Um, so that's why I was so intrigued by your book. And I wanted, of course, anytime I get a chance to talk to you, is always a wonderful, uh, wonderful time. But so to get into it, what makes great dialogue, in your opinion? Great dialogue is really very specific to the person and the context and everything that goes around around with that character. So it includes the vocabulary, it includes the rhythms, it includes the backstory, sort of who is this person and how do they express it versus how somebody else expresses it. So it's not it's not just saying the text. It's not just saying I have to go to Milwaukee. It's finding an interesting way to say, got to get some more of that Schlitz beer. Here I go. <laughs> right. So that that's two different. So that's two very different ways of saying the exact same thing. So you got to go to Milwaukee, but one's a lot more interesting than hey, I'm going to Milwaukee. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> And is that what makes dialogue kings like Tarantino, Mamet, and Sorkin so good? I mean, because I mean, that, their dialogue is just so crispy, and it just pops off the off the screen and off the page. 
Yes, and they know how to define each character. So there are different rhythms. They know how to work with subtext, the underlying meanings of dialogue. I love that opening scene of Inglorious Bastards. Oh. It's just so rich with subtext. It's, here comes these Nazis and the farm guy who's ready to bring them into the house. And he tells his daughter, you know, go into the house. Don't run. <laughs> like you think, oh, obviously something is going on. And also, why is he so nervous? What What's happening here? They're just having a nice, normal conversation. But, oh, something else is happening here. And it's it's literally under the floor. So it's like, like literally, it's like, so you're talking about it's, vis- it's visual subtext. <laughs> it's fascinating, yes, that scene. You finally find out the Jews are hiding under the table and is on top of the little carpet, which is under the floor. And of course, the Nazi guy seems to know all along there's something here and he is going to find it out. It's, it's fascinating because I honestly think that scene was what kind of locked him in for the Oscar when he won the Oscar for Inglorious Bastards. I mean, it's just such a, yes. it's a masterclass in dialogue. Yes. He, he has a real voice as a writer, meaning that he as an artist has a specific way of doing his films. You can go to the movie theater and say, Oh, uh, what, what is this movie? Who's it by? And within a couple minutes you say, Oh, I'm watching a Tarantino film. Because he knows what he's doing. He knows his rhythms. Uh, he's, he's just very good at what he does. Now, as far as um, you, you mentioned backstory, how important and, – and please can you tell the audience the importance of backstory to not only character but to dialogue? Because it, the backstory a – lot, a lot of times when I read scripts, the characters are kind of – wooden um you know almost made of cardboard because there's no depth to them whatsoever and then hence the dialogue isn't it doesn't have any depth to it i think what makes tarantino and and mamet and sorkin so good is that there's so much depth into their characters that allows dialogue to come out so wonderfully that makes sense to do it as opposed to just kind of like uh painting an old fence uh trying to make it new again there's no depth back there i mean that's not a good analogy but you know what i'm saying so what what, what do you think in regards to that well, backstory is really what went on before the character entered the movie. What uh, what kind of family do they come from? What kind of education? What kind of socioeconomic class? All, what kind of religion? All of this information can be used by the writer to make that character much more specific. So, for instance, I'm from a little, little town in northern Wisconsin named Peshtigo. And if you, when I say the word about, um, you will hear a slight Canadian or northern Wisconsin accent. Mm -hmm. So people have these various accents that they, you know, or dialects that they bring to it. And they also have phrases that they use or they have a sense, for instance, if we were driving past a group of cows, and I might say those are heifers, and you might say, how does she know that? Well, Wisconsin is cow country. I grew up around. I, I wasn't on a farm. So you think about all these details of how we thread our speech with with things that tell somebody else, oh, I hear a little bit of Alabama there. Or you have a um, you insert a phrase in the dialogue, and then says, "Gosh, that's so southern!" Like, give me a little sugar, honey. Mm-hmm. Now you're not supposed to give them a sugar bowl. You're supposed to have the <laughs> south thing and just say, "Oh, I know what that means." Or in the south, sometimes they say, "God bless him," which really means ease. God's the only person who could possibly bless that kind of stupidity. <laughs> so we, you know, various countries, various cultures have these sayings. And sometimes just um, putting them in, they tell us the backstory. They tell us where is that person from. And I will even talk in a different rhythm. For instance, being a Midwesterner, listen to me, I probably don't have the same hurried rhythm of a New Yorker or the same languid rhythm you might get from somebody from the South. 
Now, I know you're going to talk to my co-author later, John Winston Rainey. Uh, John has been all over the place from Oklahoma to Michigan to New York. And when you start thinking about all the accents and patterns that someone like that has picked up versus me who stayed pretty much in Peshtigo, Wisconsin until I was 18. Mm -hmm. So that so so like a movie like Fargo. Uh, if you would put Fargo into Los Angeles, it's not really as inch. It's not. I mean, you could have the exact same dialogue, um, but some of that dialogue wouldn't even make sense because you're in Los Angeles because it's so yeah. specific to the region. But what makes Fargo so one of that's the kind of first time. I mean, I'm from South Florida uh, originally and raised in New York and South Florida and now in L.A. So I have no idea about. Wisconsin or Montana or those kind of upper northern states, the first experience I had with it was Fargo. I was like, what? yes. what's that accent? I've never heard of that before. Yes, because all those Scandinavians settled in the North Dakota, South Dakota, you know, Minnesota, Wisconsin. And so you do have these speech patterns and um, it, it's and it's so cold. <laughs> I mean, it is cold. It's I mean, it is so cold. I, I came from a place <laughs> where it's sometimes fifty degrees below zero, and I could identify with Fargo and where they were. All that snow, all the time. <laughs> yes, yes, all the time. And then when Marge at the end says. You know, how could you have killed someone? It's such a beautiful day, and it's nothing but a whiteout in snow. And you say, yep, <laughs> that's somebody who's been around snow and cold. And still, still see the beauty. So that's another thing you were saying about tempo. That's something very interesting. That's not something I hear very often when, this, when people are discussing dialogue. Tempo of dialogue based on yes. region, based on dialect. Um, of the character is so important. So you you just kind of touched upon that. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yes. So tempo, and I'm going to actually read a touch from the dialogue book. Okay, oh, go for it. So when, um, you have a number of different kinds of writers who use different rhythms and tempo. So for instance, uh, Harold Pinter is known for his pauses and everything is slowed down. So Emma says, you know what I found out last night? He's betrayed me for years. Now, you can see how the writing forces you into that. And then you have a, a movie like Network. He says, I'm going to leave you alone. I want you to get mad. I don't want you to protest. I don't want you to riot. I don't want you to write to your congressman because I wouldn't know what to tell you to write. I don't know what to do. And at the end, he says, you've got to say, I'm a human being. God damn it. My life is valuable. Now, you cannot read that slowly. No. It, is, it is written with that sense. And the, a good, great dialogue means that anyone can read it and sound relatively good. So when I read that, it probably wasn't awful, right? I mean, there was, I was getting in the rhythm. It. Now, I'm a, I'm a terrible actress. I, I got a C <laughs> in acting in graduate school. I was not allowed to go to the next class because you had to get a B to go to the next class. So, I mean, that's, we're talking about pretty bad. But when you have this kind of great dialogue, you, it, it starts the actor in that rhythm, and then you hope there's a great actor who's going to go further and start getting nuances, you know, as well. And when you get into accents and dialogues uh, and dialects, then you have different rhythms, like the Irish rhythm. We have a quote from uh, writers of the Sea World together now, Michael and Seamus and I. And you get this Irish lilt or... Um, the Cockney, you know, oh. all I want is a, song, is a room right. somewhere far away from the cold night air. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, is Ed resting on my knee and the um, all these details. When are the H's dropped? When do people not say the I-N-G? When do they say gonna instead of going to, uh, which tells us educational level, tells us informal versus formal speech. So the writer needs to be aware of all those layers. And sometimes that means the research. You 
you go someplace, you say, I just got to listen for a while. And then I have to repeat those rhythms to myself and get them inside me. So when I write, I am writing for that person in that particular rhythm. Yeah, I've, 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 I've realized even in my own writing, but when I've read other people's scripts that a lot of times when it comes to dialogue, sometimes they'll just go, Oh, it's going to go there or they'll use a slang, but there's no, there's no basis for it. They're just kind of like on the, on the whim. It's kind of like just your, it's like jazz. They're improvising as they go along yes. uh, with certain, that's, that's where you start seeing like, Oh, that's, that's not working. Um, that character. And then there's, when you don't feel that connect, that, that straight line from the beginning to the end of the movie with that, that character from that character's point of view. So if Marcellus Wallace from Pulp Fiction all of a sudden starts talking in a cockney tempo or, or in an extremely educated, not, you know, you know, Harvard level professorial dial, like dialogue, it doesn't work. Um, at all for that character. But sometimes that's where writers make a lot of mistakes. Do you agree? Yes. And they just think that in order to have informal uh, vocals, audio speech, as opposed to what's written, they have to put on in the gunas and the wanas. And they say, but it doesn't fit that character because you're trying to clarify. That's not an informal character. That's, that's the professor. That is talking, and it doesn't mean a professor will never say gonna, but it does say you want to establish that professor is a different person than, let's say, the rancher who might have a um, different, not only those kind of informal speeches, but also certain um, patterns and now I live in Colorado, and cowboys will say you see what I'm saying? Now, mm -hmm. you really can't see what someone is saying. It's not literal. But they say it all the time. And in Colorado, people say cool, almost like it's spelled K-E-W-L as opposed to cool, which might be a more jazzy way of saying it. So you, when you go into another culture, sometimes what you want to do, you not only listen, but get file folders and start saying, this is my cowboy speech. This is my educator speech. This is what I heard a scientist say. So that you have that to draw on when you're doing that kind of character. You can say, let me open my, um, let me open my folder because I have to write my children's dialogue and I, I'm just trying to think where to go with it. Wait a minute. I copied down children's dialogue over the last 10 years. So I can look, you know, I can look at it. If, if you look at a movie like Shawshank, which is a movie I talk about constantly, it's one of my favorite scripts uh, and movies of all time. You see all the individual cons in the film, uh, convicts that are playing around. They each have very specific voices. Um, you know, I mean, Andy, obviously, Andy and, and Morgan Freeman and Red – they have their specific tone. Um, it's always funny. I always love the story that Red was orig originally Irish, uh, <laughs> hence the name Red. But when Morgan Freeman, he got the part, <laughs> which makes that character so much more interesting. Um, but these other characters have their specific uh, tone, uh, accents, um, points of view even. Um, and it, it, it's just such a wonderful um, collage. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons why that that works so well, even to the old man that, you know, at the end, you know, spoiler alert that hangs himself. Um, he has a very specific point of view because of the time period and his age and all of that. So, um, I mean, do you agree that's a, a good yes. example? Yes. And it's a good thing for writers to watch movies like that several times, then to also read the script. Usually you can get the script pretty easily. If you can't find it, go to Script City in Los Angeles because Dan will send you whatever you need to have to read it. And then read it to yourself and read it out loud to begin to feel the difference between these different characters. And then when somebody writes a script, decide this morning I am only going to do Amy's dialogue. And I'm going to look at everything of Amy and make sure she's consistent and interesting. And I'm going to shade it in and nuance it. 
Uh, now this afternoon, I'm going to do Jim's dialogue and just work on that and then say it out loud because the other thing with dialogue, you need to be able to say it. And there's a lot of tongue twisters that writers put in that they really don't mean to. Uh, when I was in uh, college, I was in a Greek play, Hecuba, and I had one line of dialogue. Only one because I wasn't a good actress. <laughs> and the line of dialogue was, surely no man could be so callous and so hard of heart that he could hear this woman's heartful, heartless cry and not be touched. Wow. Now, you cannot say that line of dialogue well. They finally took it away from me, so I was simply another person in the chorus. And the person who then was handed the line, she couldn't say that line well either. So there are times when you, why it's really important for writers, read the whole script out loud and find those places where the actor simply cannot say it, no matter how good that actor is. Yeah, I, I was watching a behind the scenes of uh, Star Wars, the original Star Wars, and Carrie Fisher was just saying, George wrote this dialogue that's so... <laughs> She, you just like rattle off. Oh, general stuff. I heard your foul stench, and like, and it's just this whole thing. Yes. It's like she's like, you. You can write. They said you can write this crap, but you can't say it. Yes, yes, <laughs> and and you have to help the writer, uh, the the actor with that, which is another reason why John and I in this book recommend people take acting lessons. Mm -hmm. That writers should have that experience to say, now I know what it's like to think through this role and try to get all my clues on how the character is, who the character is. But I also you know, need to know how to read a line and, I, and to assess whether or not that line can be said and carries the meanings that we want it to. Now, can you talk a little bit about how dialogue can help reveal the world of the character? Because it's something that a lot of times I think it's lost opportunities when it comes to, to writing dialogue. Yes. Well, we all live in a context and we have backgrounds and in different careers, for instance. So in the writing world, if I said to you, well, you know, I think the first turning point is a little late, you would know what I'm talking about. But if I said it to someone else, they might say, Wait, are you talking about ballet? There's that movie called The Turning Point. No, I'm not talking about ballet. And one of the tricks is to find the specific dialogue and make it clear enough that you will know what I'm talking about. So my co-author, John Rainey, and I are both musicians. We both play piano. We, we would do duets when we needed breaks. And... Um, well, uh, so if I said to you, I think we should do a glissando at the end of this. Now, you might say, I don't, you in the audience might say, what in the world is a glissando? So I might say, let's do a glissando here. And then I put my fingers on the keys and I roll all through the keys, you know, <laughs> I play 20 keys, um, just whoosh. Mm -hmm. And you say, oh, now I know what a glissando is. Or um, I come out of the horseback riding world. So if I said to somebody, a character, uh, do your flying lead change in the middle of the circle, I'd say, well, a lot of people don't know what a flying lead change is on a horse. But if I had a close-up of the camera and say, now, and you see the horse shift its feet like a little skip, you say, oh, yeah, that's it. So there are times you take a word or a line of dialogue and say, I got to illustrate this because many people won't know what it is. Other times you might have a medical person just roll out all the, this dialogue with all these words you've never heard of. And you think it really doesn't matter that I need to know what's going on with the person's esophagus. What I need to know is when the doctor says, get this person to ER fast after saying three lines of something I have no idea what he's talking about, I got it. And I said, I, I don't need to know exactly what this is in this case. 
And what happens a lot of times is writers get so deeply into having the specific vocabulary that no one knows what they're talking about. Or they are so concerned about the clarity that they don't get the specifics. So one of the things John and I talk about is that dialogue is communication and expression. And you're always balancing the thing to say, what does the audience need to know? How do I clarify it while still expressing each character very, very clearly? Very cool. Now, um, one of the other things I find with dialogue, and especially when I'm writing, is the conversational aspect of it. It sometimes becomes a little too sterile or a little too ac- academic, meaning that it's you're writing like you're, you're you're writing dialogue as you would write, not as you would speak. What advice would you give to make dialogue a little bit more conversational? Well, one thing in screenwriting, the dialogue is like a tennis ball. You never want it to be in the other person's court for very long. So it goes, you know, we could say it goes back and forth from one character to the other. And generally in screenwriting, dialogue is about two or three sentences before the ball gets sent back with the next piece of dialogue, the other person. So there is a flow. Sometimes in novels, once in a while in films and screenwriting, you will see a longer speech um, Tarantino. It's, it's like Tarantino. pretty, you know, it's it's pretty unusual to see that. Mm-hmm. So you're always looking for what that flow is, which makes it more conversational. And then you are looking for the words that make it more conversational. So we probably are not going to use any really, really big words in this interview. But if I'm writing, I might decide to do some big word because I think it's kind of carries a lot of levels of meaning or it's sort of a delicious kind of word. So you're, um, you're always balancing this, but another thing is simply to listen to people talk, write it down and, and say, ah, this, and see if you can figure out from what they say something about the specifics. So, um, Many years ago, I interviewed one of the writers of Rain Man, and he kept using words where I said to him, are you a Buddhist? And he said, actually, he said, I'm a Presbyterian, but he said, I actually feel very connected with Buddhism because words, let's let's say a word like detachment or a word like mindfulness, Mm -hmm. you know, you start hearing these words and you say, oh, I'm getting hints about something about that person. So it's always saying, uh, because dialogue is so refined, you know, you're, you're saying, what's, I can't do my eight sentences. How do I really hone this? So you start honing it for those specifics. And, and so much of dialogue writing is you rewrite and you rewrite and you rewrite. You, you work for the right word. You go for the right rhythm. You say it doesn't quite sound like a Alabama person. Okay, I need to do a little more research on Alabama. And, oh, now I need to do research on scientists at Alabama. And so and many times you say, who can I talk to? Who, who would know about this? Or who can I have read this to feed back to me? You are off. So, for instance, in the uh, How to Write Great Dialogue book, we have a chapter on accents and dialects. So, I found a acting coach in New York who teaches people accents and dialects, and she graciously, without even charging me agreed to read the chapter and give me feedback on uh, that chapter. So you don't want to just throw something in there. And the same thing, I I sent that chapter to my friends in England and said, check those few references to England. And then, you know, John was working on it and he knows all the Southern stuff. And uh, he had a friend who knew about dialects too. So you always think about how do I make sure I got it right and how do I make sure I got it artistic? 
Now there was a, there was um it was very interesting in regards to dialect. Uh, if you remember Forrest Gump, Tom Hanks, who yes. obviously won the Oscar for that amazing dialect. Originally, the dialect, the, the director Rob Zemeckis wanted him to f- um wanted the kid who played Little Forrest to follow Tom and try to, <clears throat> but Tom's like, no, his his accent's perfect, and he actually started f- finding that accent. But it was interesting how. And he's just like the the tones, the beats, the – he wouldn't have been able to come up that without having Little Forest around. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, and that is one of the things, the listening and sometimes called the flavor of the speech. So mm-hmm. there are times when you get so deeply into the dialect that – you can't understand what the person is saying. I, I've seen British movies. I said, I, I have no idea what's going on. I mean, they are, <laughs> and, and, and they are so clear about their expression. And maybe people in England understand what's going on, but I need subtext, you know, and subtitles. But um, that is, you know, one, one of the things that sometimes said is you get the flavor of the Southern accent, because if you did Tennessee, too much, you, you might it. be like a foreign language. And, uh, you know, there's certain Southern accents you say, I have no idea what they're talking about. So you say, okay, what do, what do I need to go after? I need to go after maybe dropping the H's or I need to go be careful of my INGs or, you know, or use the D sound instead of the TH sound, which uh, you like find in Huckleberry Finn, for instance. But do you actually, when you're writing the dialogue, do you suggest dropping the H in the dialogue as you're writing it? Or do you suggest that? How does that work? Well, there's, there's different opinions on this. But I think if it's still understandable when you read it, then I would say yes. You know, give as much of a flavor as you can in the script itself. Then you expect that the actor will then go to a coach if, if it's not sort of what their background is. Um, Mary McDonald, you know, who's in Dances with Wolves, mm-hmm. she was in another, um, I think it was when she did Passion Fish, and she said, the director said, Mary, you have just crossed from Georgia to North Carolina <laughs> in your accent. So you really often need that coach to say, no, no, the A is not sounded that way. And think about people who are so good at doing these, like Meryl Streep, for instance, just a master and, of course, has a coach. Yeah, I mean, if you, I, I've seen movies that have a, a strong Boston accent that I can't understand or um, in the, you know, Bayou, in the Bayou, like the, that accent's so strong that you're just like, I, I need subtitles. I literally will turn on closed captioning or I'll turn on yes. subtitles. Yeah, I I think that standard English is actually considered from Iowa. Mm -hmm. And there are people like us from Wisconsin, the Midwest, who think we don't have an accent. (laughs) (laughs) When I went to college and people said, are you from Canada? I said, why would you think that? Well, it's certain words, I say. It's kind of like Canadians came down into northern Wisconsin. It's like Canadian-ish. It's like a, yes. it's a, it's just like a, sl- yes. a little bit of a flavor, if you will. You're not a full aboot, but you're getting close. <laughs> yes, yeah. And one of the things they said, I think in the full Monte, is they said that the accent was actually 30 miles away from where it took place. And it got criticized because it wasn't exactly, I think it's a Sheffield you uh-huh. know, accent. And then in Billy Elliot, they considered trying to tone down that accent when they did the New York play, and there was such an uproar. They said, no, we'll just try to get the kids to enunciate well enough. But um, these, you know, all these accents, very, very specific from one, you know, one place to, to another. another. And it does add a tremendous amount of flavor to a character when you when you give them those accents. I mean, like we were saying with Fargo, I mean, and, and, and other um what was that movie? Um the the one oh the town uh with Ben Affleck in oh, oh, yes. in the yes. Boston. I mean I mean I've heard the Boston accent before. I've I've gone to Boston and something, but in that movie it's so it's so there. <laughs> yes, yes. And one of the things with accents and dialogues, uh, dialects also has to do with you, you have to be careful about it falling into cliche. 
Right. So, for instance, Huckleberry Finn has eight different accents in it. <laughs> it has the white and has the Pike County and it's um, in the black and the lower educated black and the lower educated white. And, um, and it does sometimes get a critique of that. But um, one of the books I, I looked at was this, was this, uh, it was Hearst and, um, gosh, I sometimes forget her first name, but it was her book about the last slave that came in the last slave ship in 1860 and died in 1927. And she interviewed him and really looked at his language. And what's interested me was his language in many ways was much like Huckleberry Finn, the, the D, dat, and dem. And I tried to do some research on this because I said, is this a stereotype or did they actually hear this? But um, the research I did said that is what happens because certain cultures can't say the same words we say in English. So, for instance, the Japanese culture, the L's, you, it's really hard to say the L, so you can't say lollygag. <laughs> you know, you know, I, I, I don't know when the last time I used the word lollygag is, but I, obviously I need to use it much more often. <laughs> yeah. It's like cornucopia. Yeah. Like cornucopia. Like you need, yeah, yeah. How often do you use that word? I had a, a Japanese doctor and uh, as a chiropractor, and he would actually ask me to give him some good L words so he can practice them. <laughs> so we would, I'd throw all these kind of words. And I can't do a double R like for Spanish. So yeah, the best I, yeah. I can do is pero, which is different than the word for dog, which has the rolled two R's. So that would be, and, if, if I may, it might be so bold, yes. el perro. Yes, <laughs> see, you can do that. And the thing we also understand to some extent is that we grow up and we train our mouths to do certain words because that's what we learn, you know, in our culture. Mm -hmm. And then we try to do another language. And a lot of people like me can't do it because I didn't grow up with another language. And there's there's certain of those tongue things that I'm not able to do, but Absolutely. you did excellent. Yes, well, I mean, I am I am a Cuban man, um, yes. so uh, so it took me. I lost my I lost my R when I was a kid, and then now I actually have uh, I've, I've picked it up later in life. But uh, before it was Pero uh, Pero for a long time until I finally got got that R. That uh, so <laughs> it took a second, but I got it. And you were talking about stereotypes. One of the most famous Cuban stereotypes types of all time is not only Ricky Ricardo, but also um, Scarface, Tony Montana. Oh. And both of those guys, um, you know, Ricky spoke, Ricky Ricardo spoke like, um, spoke like a, uh, a Cuban of, of that time period. But then Tony Montana took it completely to the stereotypical side. I still love his performance. And even though he's a, an Italian man, uh, Mr. Pacino, but it was almost cartoonish. Um, yes. In, in, in the way, and that whole movie is very big and cartoonish, uh, in general, um, with the violence and the way it was portrayed. But talking about, um, going into, uh, into almost parody, <laughs> it was yes. getting close to yeah. parody. And, and we suggest in, um, writing great dialogue, um, that, People don't shy away from accents and dialects. They actually take that as a challenge. And you do your research and you listen and you say, how am I going to write this to get the flavor of it? And how is the actor going to do it to actually add some other details as well? So I think what happens, people get scared, but then they aren't differentiating their characters well enough. Exactly. Now, one of the biggest mistakes um, – I've, I've, I, when I started writing that I got called out on, and then every time I read a script, um, or we do coverage on a script is on the nose dialogue. Yes. Can you discuss on the nose dialogue and how the heck to avoid it? Yes. Well, sometimes you need to write it uh, on the nose to say, yes, this is what, um, this is what I need to get across. I'm going to Milwaukee and we're going to take route 80. So, Say I got that, and I might have to write that in the first draft, maybe even the second or third, 
But now I'm going to go back and I'm going to start honing and tweaking and finding ways to do that more interesting. One of, uh, one of the chapters in You're Talking to Me is about the mission or the intention or the objective of the character. And one of my favorite pieces of dialogue comes from The Fugitive, where Sam Gerard says, your fugitive's name is Dr. Richard Kimball. Go get him. <laughs> right. Now, what he's really saying, it could be the first or second or third draft is is it could have been go find him mm-hmm. or your job is to go get him is to go find him and arrest him or but go get him that's what you say to a pit bull that you know and so you get this immediate thing sam gerard is a pit bull and he will not let go of the person he is after so you could imagine someplace along the draft after writing the t- text, say, I now need to do it that it layers. So how do I write a sentence? What do I want to say about this character? How might he say this versus somebody else who's not like a pit bull, but somebody who's maybe um, more intellectual? And uh, so you you hear all of these, the listen up, you know, a guy is someone who says guys instead of fellows, who says fellows instead of, hey, you all. So right. you're, you're saying, I might have to go through that stage of writing it on the nose. Uh, one of the people who endorsed this book is Treva Silverman, who was the first woman to win, win an Emmy Award, and she won it for the Mary Tyler Moore Show. And I asked Treva once, I said, well, how often do you rewrite dialogue? She said, well, this morning it was 22 times. Now, she's a comedy writer. I honestly don't know if it was 19, 12, or 22. It, 22 probably sounded better. The, that morning but what she's saying is you don't just write it and say there it is you rewrite and rewrite I, I often have a saying even with my writing on book writing nonfiction writing if I have not rewritten a sentence 10 times it's probably not good enough and I, I just say, you're going to just rewrite and rewrite because you're going to switch the rhythms and you're going to say, I don't like that word. It's not rich. And um, When John and I were uh, writing this book, um, John had a tendency sometimes to use big words. And I said, John, you don't want them yeah. going in the dictionary. And if I don't understand that, probably most people won't. And so sometimes we'd say, okay, you can use the word, but you have to define it right after, <laughs> like a, a nice phrase that ex- clarifies, you know, what it is. And so I, I think finally at the end, out of humor, I said, how about this, John, is you can do one really big word in this whole book that no one will understand, but only one. Is that okay? <laughs> like, yes. So we had, we had a... Um, we had a good relationship writing this book uh, together and pulling these different ideas about writing and about dialogue and um, different, you know, all, all these different techniques, et cetera, that you have to pull together when you co-write. Yeah. And, and I agree with you when I was writing my books as well, I, I will, I'll write one just to get, so there are not, not, there was the fiction, but there was a kind of autobiography and then there was the nonfiction uh, book. And with the nonfiction, you just write all, just get it all out, get everything out first and then go back and you start, you get start, you know, you add it. I like to say you, you're laying down the foundation, you're putting up the framing of the house and then, and the walls. And then slowly you go back and you start painting the walls. You start decorating. Yes. You start putting things where you want it to go. But but the base is there for you to kind of go go and do that work in. It is super important. And I think that is one of the mistakes of – especially screenwriters make. They'll write their first draft and I'm like, okay, that was easy. Yes. Yeah. And you say, no, you're just at the beginning stage now. <laughs> do the very, very, yeah, very, yes. very beginning. Now, what are some other things you should avoid when uh, writing dialogue? Uh, actually, the last chapter is about what we call the red flags. And a red flag is sorry or 
yes. So I can't tell you how many times I've read yes in a in a script. With an exclamation point, of um, course. So yeah, and so <laughs> all these kind of cliches um that are as you say, you know, very much on the nose. Um sometimes people write screaming in the parentheses next to the character's name when it is very clear that you know, if you say, if the dialogue is get out of here, you're probably not going to say it like get out of here. <laughs> it's, you're going Unless, to have uh, you, or or it could, depending on the performance yes. choice. And if yes. it works, it might be much more terrified to say, get Yeah, out yes. Of here. <laughs> and because the actor might then approach that line and say, What am I going to, you know, do with that? So um the, it, it's all of or the one that says, You're gonna be okay. Mm-hmm. You're lying on the ground. You've just been shot in the head. <laughs> you ready yeah. to do your last breath? There's can't, blood can't whisper all over. Can't whisper that. You can't know, whisper that. and the person said, "It's okay. You're going to be okay." <laughs> it's like, oh, the best thing to say is, "You are ready to die." <laughs> it's their last, not not last phrase. Is there one last word you want to say at that moment? So um, you, it's really avoiding a lot of a lot of cliches. I I think the other thing in writing one has to be careful about something I said in many many of the scripts I consulted on. Be careful of indefinite pronouns. Though, well, what did he do? Well, no, wait. There's three he's in the room. Which he are we talking to? And so there's that unclarity of writing that people sometimes do and say, I I don't know what you're talking about. Go for clarity and communication if needed, and then find a interesting way to maybe repeat that he. Very you know, cool. Use a nickname, whatever. Another thing is introductions. John, this is Mary. Mary, this is John. John's from Chicago. Oh, I've been to Chicago. What do you do there? Well, I... I call it date chat. Mm-hmm. You know, first date chat is say, oh, no, no. <laughs> you know, we, we play, John and I would play around with things like, you know, I'm going to Chicago. And, and the woman says, why would you want to go to Chicago when there's so much fun here? <laughs> and so, you know, there's, there's like, have fun with your dialogue and say, how do I get these layers? How, how do I get all the, you know, what's, or as we say, what's, what's beneath, <laughs> what lies beneath? I, I guess, you know, I have a book I'll call writing great subtext, you know, mm-hmm. writing subtext. And so subtext is that underlying meaning and then in you talking to me is we have a whole chapter on subtext and getting the, the rumblings and, and the undercurrents that go into what are you really trying to say here. Now, there was a chapter that in your book that absolutely intrigued me, and I have never even thought about this, but I think it's something we should definitely talk about. How do you write dialogue for animals, aliens, and other critters? Yes. Oh, that was such a fun chapter. So one of, um, because it is true. People say, I'm never going to write dialogue for animals. You say, you probably will. You might have a dog in your movie. At least give him a a woof and a wharf and a a bow wow and figure out when they say one sound versus another. Because dialogue is... The, is communication a sound? It does not have to be a word. If you say to your dog, will you go get the paper? And the dog goes, woof, woof, and then goes get the paper. And as he's ready to put it down, he growls. There is communication. And I'm always surprised how many times there are animals in a movie and the animal doesn't have the dialogue. Like, for instance, in both Sea uh, C- Biscuit and um, Secretariat, those animals, the owners kept talking about how wonderful those horses were. There was no communication. There was none of the little neighing or the, or the snorting or all the things that animals do. So when John and I started talking about the actor, we started going back to what do we know? <laughs> so 
because I had horses for uh, about 13 years, I went to my horse trainer and I said, let's talk about all the different sounds. Like a horse will actually squeal sometimes. It's a, it almost sounds like a, a pig. Well, it usually means you're hurting him really hard. You know, you stepped on his long tail or on his foot or something like that. And uh, I, I had a horse where the first time he was in a horse show, trainer rode him. He got to the middle of the arena and he let out this plaintive neigh that it was like, where are my friends? I'm all alone in the middle here. What's going on? <laughs> and you knew exactly what was going on with that horse at, at that moment you know, of uncertainty. So one of the things people need to do is to actually analyze what do I know? And if you don't know a lot about that animal, go and talk to people who know those animals. Uh, I worked on a dragon script one time and the dragon didn't do anything and so I applied my horse knowledge to say well here's a number of different things because the dragon is sort of like a horse but not exactly. sure why not yes, yes <laughs> why not and, and another thing I did before writing that chapter is when my cat would purr I would I would I would actually vocalize with the cat and then I go to the piano to see what note is he purring on and it was the A below middle C and I said, okay, if you wrote a cat, you want to get that. It's perfect. <laughs> and, you know, and I mean, Babe is so great. I, I, let me see if I can quickly find Babe in here because one of the things that's so fabulous about Babe is that the, um, like the, the sheep go ma, you yeah. know, uh, talk about you've, the one sheep is the ma, and you have the, um, I'm just, uh, yes, well, there's, there's animals chapter. So, uh, yeah, so, so like, for instance, in Babe, um, ma says a heart of gold, and the sheep respond, heart of gold. <laughs> and the, packs, the cat says, pigs don't have a purpose. Just like ducks don't have a purpose, <laughs> and that I mean, what a just this, it's such a marvelous movie to look at to hear how every animal is differentiated and thinks what are the sounds that that animal's vocal cords make? Are they little vocal cords? Are they big? You know, they rival the aliens. Um, have this very particular, it's not only a deeper sound. sound, it's almost like a fluttering sound of the vocal cords. Yeah, like the predator too. I mean, the predator had oh, yes. those those things, even aliens and those kind of characters. Now, are you specific? So, babe is something specific, obviously, because the animals talk in that. So, obviously, you would need dialogue there. But when you're writing a, a, an average, not average, but a normal script that has an animal that has an animal being an animal, like a, a dog or a cat or a horse, are you suggesting you like horse or whatever the character of that that animal's name is, and you put ba or woof? Well, there's two ways of doing it. One is to do it in the description and say the dog rolls. Mm -hmm. And then the owner, Jack, says, stop it. It's okay. But quiet down. You know. Another one is that Jack, that the dog, you have dog, <laughs> whatever the dog, Fido. Mm -hmm. And under there is grrr. And then Jack says, quiet down. And um, it's... I think it's okay both ways. And some of it has to do with whether or not you're trying to get a flow of dialogue right. back and forth because the page will give more of a sense of the flow if you write it like dialogue. And, and also to be aware of how many different animals have far more ways of communicating than we, you know, we think we do. I mean, I'm surprised with the cat. I could literally, as we were unlocking the door... The cat would meow, and I'd say, here we are. And the cat would meow. And, I mean, literally, there was a back and forth with the meow. And, and then you tune into what kind of meows they do at any one time. Because yeah. they do have different kinds of meows as well. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. <laughs> but if you, I think the part of what we're saying is if you are going to have an animal in 
your script, use the animal. It is to actually use it as part of the dialogue and the richness of what you are writing. And you just have to turn on the TV to see how many animals are advertising things these days. From the pigs to the owls to the foxes to <laughs> oh, I, I I always tell people if you want to make a successful movie, just have a dog save Christmas and it's going to get sold. Oh well, yes, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. The dog is the, as they say in Shakespeare in Love, the bit with the dog. Don't forget the bit with the dog. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And I, I wanted to ask you. You also talked about something in your book called visual dialogue, creating a, a visual yes. with the dialogue. Can you kind of touch upon that a little bit? Yes, think of how often we use sensory words to say something like, um, it's a gray day, or I am in the pink today, or uh, I slept like a log, or, you know, we, we use a lot of sensory um, language. And one uh, good thing to do is to start thinking of that because it makes the line of dialogue pop. It's one thing to say, well, well, I mean, I can say I'm a little down. That's a sensory, but I can say I'm a bit blue. Yeah, and blue is a little is is sort of different. What you get is that image that goes with it, and you say, oh yeah, I'm getting a little more information. I loved in Ordinary People when um, the the boys said it's a gray day. That's so much better than saying, oh, you know, I, I'm not doing or how are you doing today um not too good but if you say it's a gray day it's like, oh my gosh this is so rich you know so interesting and so a good exercise is to write down all those sensory words that we tend to say anyway you know it all ended on a high note mm-hmm. or you know <laughs> whatever my my husband's and I favorite phrase is it's not over till the fat lady sings right these are all cliches, and you have to be careful not to be cliche yes. about some of this and, as well. And sometimes what you do is you play with the cliche and mm-hmm. you twist it, you know, slightly. Um, I think in Steel Magnolias, there's a line about, you know, his feet are planted firmly on the quicksand. <laughs> Something right. like that, you know. <laughs> and that uh, makes it different, absolutely. And it yeah. pops it pops a lot. I was thinking of uh, uh and I mean Tarantino has he writes so visually, but he uses pop references um mm-hmm. to kind of help along with those visual things. So like I'm gonna walk the earth like Kane and Kung Fu. Like yes. Yes. You, you're you're there so quickly yes. in your head. Um, and there was all – I'm going to be cool little Fonzies. We're all going to be cool little Fonzies. Like everybody got that right away. It was pretty yes. – it's amazing. But yes, yeah, something along those lines as you're talking about being visual. I, I love uh, James Brooks' um, oh. movie, As Good As It Gets, oh, so and good. how they take the cliche. Like there's a line where Simon, instead of saying, do you know how lucky you are, he says, do you know where you're lucky? I thought, oh, that's so interesting. It's kind of like, you know, yeah. it's kind of like the same, but it's a little twist on it. And uh, there's a lot of, we have stuff in the book from um, Steel Magnolias because it is just so, you know, it's just so rich. Uh, you know, even uh, Wheezy says, I can't get enough grease in my diet. <laughs> <laughs> I mean that's that's general for everybody. I'm assuming. Yeah, it's like, yeah. <laughs> it's like was it um, Martha? Not Martha Stewart. Um, uh, Julia Childs. Like everything's better with butter. Um, yes, well, yes. Well, well, yes. I mean, you could put a, yes, a, a shoe shoes in and base it in butter and fry <laughs> yes, it. Yeah, yeah, it's gonna yeah. taste better. <laughs> right, right. Um, so, so what are you up to now, Linda? After this book, what's the next thing for you? Well, um, I officially retired on June 1st from consulting and seminars. So the focus is now on books. Oh, congrats. And one of, and I'm going to show you first what we're doing. You see these, they're called Sager notes. Mm -hmm. We remember the cliff notes that we all read. Yes. So these are coming out the first of every month. And this is the third one, which will be out July 1st. So we've done um, African Queen and sideways in this third one is Shakespeare in Love. They're $5.25 online, and they're 
generally pretty close to 5,000 words. So they're, oh, wow. There's like small you know, little like books. Article. <laughs> yeah. So they're not a book or anything. There's, and um, they're written in order for people interested in film to say, what are the things that that film does that I can learn from? What was the challenge of writing that script and how did they solve that? Because I want to learn from the masters. So, Every one is, is what I would call a, a great example of something specific. So my next one is going to be Jojo Rabbit. Yes. And I, have, I will be starting to work on that because I, I have to have them done by the 15th and then I send them to the publisher who's in Taos. And the um, woman publisher is Allegra Houston, who's the daughter of John Houston. Nice. And she is just great. She's, uh, I've really been enjoying working with her. So um, first of every month. And yeah, you can find them either by going on my website, lindasager.com, or the um, going on, uh, I always have to remember exactly. It's the, um, oh, gosh. I'll put it go in the show notes. My, go on my website. LindaSager.com. I'll, I'll, and you could also just look up Sager Notes. But just go on LindaSager.com and you'll see the informational Sager Notes. And then, of course, the dialogue book. Yes. And, um, and so I'm turning my attention to some other books as well. I want to... I want to write about creativity and spirituality, which has been percolating for 30 years. And um, I'm going to write another book for Allegra um, and her company on um, – they're doing a thing called The Things – The Stuff They Never Teach You. And so I'm going to write a book on how to teach a class in a seminar. And um, and so we're – you know, but the Sager notes are are out as of June first. So we did two June first, then we're doing one a month. Nice. Well, it and seems it like was, you're busy. Seems like you're yes, busy. Yes. I yeah. I I'm not without anything to do, and I'm playing a lot of piano. So. And um, one last question I, I try to ask all of my guests, uh, and you haven't had this one before. What are three screenplays every screenwriter should read? Ah, yes. Um, That's a very good question. I tend to always end up putting witness on that list Mm -hmm. because it's such a perfect structure. And it's and is so good at kind of getting into another culture and, you know, community. And I think Amadeus, I call Amadeus the the big diamond of the emerald. Uh, I call Stand By Me the little, little diamond. And then I think it's an interesting thing for people to say, what script spoke to me? Was was there ever a movie that changed my life or impacted me or taught me something new that changed, you know, attitudes? And maybe just read that one to better understand how it affected you. Because pe- people sometimes ask me, they said, was there ever a movie that changed your life? And I said, oh, yes, City Slickers. City I love Slickers. that movie. Yeah, City Slickers got me back to riding, horseback riding, and I went on a cattle drive after City Slickers, and then that got me into riding around the world. I mean, I rode in France and Italy and Spain and, you know, lots of uh, Wyoming. I I took riding vacations. I entered horse shows. I mean, I just did that for quite some time. And so any of those movies where you say they're just great movies, um, I would put one more on the list because we have a whole chapter on theme and we use the movie The Defiant Ones and trace how the theme keeps changing and transforming through that whole film. It's a really in-depth analysis of how you can work with the theme through dialogue. And um, that's a great movie to watch. It's a great movie. It's a great script to read. Linda, it is always a pleasure having you on the show. Uh, anytime, you're always welcome back. It is. Uh, I learn so much every time I talk to you. So thank you so much for coming on the show and, and dropping the knowledge bombs on the tribe today. So thanks again. 
Yes, thank you. It's always a pleasure for me as well. I want to thank Linda for coming back on the show and helping us write some amazing dialogue that pops off the page. If you want to get links to anything we spoke about in this episode, including a link to the book, please head over to the show notes at bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash 079. Thank you so much for listening, guys. I hope this episode was of help to you on your screenwriting journey. Thanks again. As always, keep on writing no matter what. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast at bulletproofscreenwriting.tv. 